Welcome to Star Wars Comics and Canon. The Force is strong with this one. Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 81. So guys, this week I am tackling the second volume of the 2020 run of Darth Vader comics. This is going to be issues 6 to 11, and it makes up the trade paperback collection slash story arc called Into the Fire. If you haven't joined my show before, welcome, I hope you enjoy yourself. In essence, what I do is go through the stories of these comics, and then I also talk about connections to other Star Wars content and occasionally give my opinions on them as well. But it's not a review show, it is me going through them, so either if you've already read these comics, it adds a bit more weight, maybe some things you've missed, or the various connections and whatnot, and it kind of serves as a refresher. Or if you've never read these comics, it's a good way to familiarise yourself with the canon without having to read every single Star Wars comic there is. And if you haven't tuned in before, go back and listen to episode 79 of Star Wars Comics in Canon because that is where I tackle the first volume of these 2020 Vader comics and some of the plot threads that I'm going to be talking about in this won't make sense unless you've either already read the comics or if you've listened to my previous episode, so make sure you do that if you haven't already. And as a reminder, guys, you can listen to this show on YouTube or you can listen on any of the podcast players on the feed of Comics in Motion, however you so desire. But if you could pop over to YouTube and subscribe, that would really, really help me out because I'm trying to get up to 100 subscribers just so I can change the channel name from gobbledygook to slash genuine chit chat. So it would mean the world to me if you could do that. But my friends, with that in mind, let's get more into this comic run. And I will clarify here that if you want to check out the previous runs of Darth Vader comics, if you're on YouTube, it will already be in a Darth Vader playlist, so check out that. If you are just listening on the podcast app, then check out episode 15 of Star Wars Comics in Canon, because that is where I tackle the first volume of the 2015 run of Darth Vader comics, written by Kieran Gillen, and that introduces Dr. Aphra and stuff. Or you can check out episode 62 of Star Wars Comics in Canon, where I started on the first volume of the 2017 run of Vader comics and that is written by Charles Saul is set after Revenge of the Sith you get to see how Vader got his lightsaber how he got his fortress on Mustafar a few other bits and pieces there so they're two very very good runs of Vader comics for different reasons and that first one in 2015 is set between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back while this 2020 run is set after Empire Strikes Back but before Return of the Jedi so that's a good idea of timeline and this one is set between three years after the Battle of Yavin and four years after the Battle of Yavin because Empire Strikes Back is so three years, and Return of the Jedi is four years after. So um, yeah, that's the background information, so let's get into the releases of these comics themselves. So issue number six was released October 2020, issue 11 was released April 2021, the trade paperback collection of these six comics was released in June 2021, the writer of all of these comics is Greg Pak, the artist is Raphael Ienko, and the colour artist is Niraj Menon. So guys, there's not much else to add here. So let's get into this first comic, which is issue number six. And here is The Crawl. Darth Vader revealed the truth. He is Luke Skywalker's father. But Luke refused Vader's call to the dark side of the Force and escaped. Enraged, Vader tore through the galaxy on a quest of revenge against everyone who hid Luke from him. Now he finally understands the truth about the death of Padme, the wife of the man Vader used to be. And Vader's master, Emperor Palpatine, is not pleased with Vader's rebellion. So as confirmed slightly earlier and in episode 79 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, Vader, after Empire Strikes Back, basically just left and went on his own little mission. He met up with the handmaidens um, of Padme, so that was like Sabe and a few others that you get to see in, I think, Phantom Menace and then in the Queen's Trilogy by E.K. Johnston. And he basically found them and they're clearly rebels and he just didn't kill them. He killed like a bunch of other rebels, but because they all basically looked like Padme, he couldn't really kill them and he just let them all go. Uh, he then travels to Tatooine and to Naboo and then eventually goes to Polis Massa, which is the asteroid in which Luke and Leia were born on in episode three, Revenge of the Sith. And that is where Padme dies. So he watched the recording of Padme dying and sees that she says, you know, there's still good in him, Obi-Wan, that sort of thing. So that is a summary of the previous volume and the final all sort of panels of the comic ended with Palpatine saying that Vader was wallowing in grief and he needs to learn through fear. And that is where we kickstart this. So, issue number six. 
So there's quite a few connections in this one. So it starts off in the Imperial Palace on Coruscant. The Imperial Palace used to be the Jedi Temple, and then in the 2017 run of Vader comics, it goes through Palpatine basically renovating it and sorting it out with the Inquisitors and etc. But it used to be the Jedi Temple. And Coruscant itself, I'm not sure on the show if I've actually given much bio information onto Coruscant, if you can even call it bio information, info on the planet. So um, here's a dump of information about Coruscant that I find quite interesting. So it is a core world. Its coordinates are actually 0, 0, 0, so it is classed as like the center of the known galaxy in a lot of ways. It has 24-hour days and 365 days days a year, so it is the same as Earth. Its diameter is 12.2 kilometers, and Earth's diameter is 12.7 kilometers. So it's very similar in size to Earth. It's a smidge smaller, and it has the same general cycles. It is called an ecumenopolis, which means it is a planet covered in a city. So there are lots of different biomes for planets. Some are forests, some are water worlds, you know, and there's varying opolis names for them. But because this planet is just completely covered in city, it is an ecumenopolis. There are more than a trillion citizens on the planet. There are multiple levels of it. The richest are generally at the top, which is where you can see the sky and the sun and that sort of thing. And then it goes down by thousands of levels. 1313 is a very popular level. That's in the Clone Wars. That was a cancelled game that I don't know if it's ever going to get revived. But basically 1313 was quite a lower level. But I'm pretty certain it goes down even lower than that. It's just thousands upon thousands of floors that goes deeper and deeper into the core. And obviously those people live down there don't ever get to see the sunlight or anything like that i think there's a lot of like polluting gases and stuff so you know the lower down you go generally the lower down you are financially in addition a little bit of history it is believed to be the home world of humanity obviously one of the many reasons it is so close to earth even though obviously in star wars it always starts with you know a long time ago in a galaxy far far away wouldn't it be fun if star wars was real and then it turned out that just like a few humans maybe like a pod of them got shot out from coruscant trying to find the new frontier went through some sort of crazy wormhole and then ended up in earth and then they were called like adam and eve or something and then that kind of kick-started things that is a fun way i think legends may have done something vaguely similar to that in one sort of story i'm certain the canon will not even go near that at all because then it just makes everything a bit too real i suppose and obviously then you've got individuals who believe in certain religions or spiritualities who probably wouldn't take too kindly to thinking that star wars has cracked the code of what caused humanity but anyway, I digress. Uh, in the Star Wars universe, yeah, it is believed to be the homeworld of humanity Coruscant. And then there are two species that are about before humans. One is called the Taung, T-A-U-N-G, and the other is the Zell, Z-H-E-L-L. -L. They are perceived to be before humans, and it's either believed that they were there before humans, or they potentially became humans. In canon, there's not that much. I'm not going to go into the legend's history of Coruscant, because I will literally be here all day. I'd have to do like a whole episode on that. But those are some nice little facts about Coruscant I thought were quite interesting in the canon. So anyway, we move on. So Palpatine is basically electrocuting Vader now. Uh, Vader's got his lightsaber blocking it and is walking towards Palpatine, asking why he's trying to electrocute him. And Palpatine asks the Grand Vizier, who is Mars Ahmeda, who is, you know, one of Palpatine's right-hand man. He's a Shadrian. He's like blue. He's got tentacles that kind of go down from the top of his head to his shoulders. And he's in all of the prequels. And Mars Ahmeda explains to Vader that he failed to turn Skywalker to the dark side. He then went on this random personal mission without telling anyone or asking permission to do so. And then he came across numerous rebels, including many spies for Padme Amidala and things. And instead of killing them like he was meant to, he let them go. And now he's come back and he's wallowing in self-pity. So that is... At the very least, a massive mistake, but at the most, it is treason. And what is treason punishable by? Death. And with that, the Imperial Royal Guard then attack Vader. So the Imperial Royal Guards, they're called a mild variety of things. There's the Royal Guard, there's the Red Royal Guard, there's the Emperor's Royal Guard, there's the Imperial Royal Guard. They're all the same thing. It's just if it's a Royal Guard in the era of the Empire, then it is Palpatine's Royal Guard. So they are specifically trained. They were just stormtroopers who were just excelling at everything they don't talk they're not meant to have any emotional capacity they're meant to just stand in a place and be dead silent for hours and hours if not days and palpatine created the red guards during the prequel era i think it's between phantom menace and an attack of the clones i think around that era and they are separate to the Coruscant's royal guard so Coruscant had or the senate had their own guard which were the cerulean guards 
And I know that Naboo had their own guards as well. I think might have been the Blue Guard or the Cerulean Guard as well. But basically Palpatine trained up these Red Guards to be his own personal guard during the Clone Wars and etc. And then obviously with the fall of the Republic and the rise of the Empire, he kept that going. They just It's funny because in the movies they seem very weak because they just don't really do anything apart from Yoda slamming them against a wall in Revenge of the Sith. But in the comics and things, there's the Lando comic written by Charles Saul, which I tackled a while ago on Star Wars Comics and Canon on episode 18. And Lando comes into contact with the Emperor's Royal Guard. And basically, if you're not a Force user, or you're not at least an adept Force user, they are very, very hard to kill. Uh, although <laughs> the movies seem to show something different. But Vader fights these guards. He manages to disarm them quite quickly because... He doesn't have his lightsaber because Palpatine just pulled it away from him when the guards went to attack. He got, you know, shocked a couple times. He disarms the guards, smashes them and KOs them. And then Maz Armeda pulls out a blaster, tries to shoot Vader with it. And Vader responds by choking Maz Armeda and the two royal guards. And then Palpatine, in response, then chokes Vader. There's some really cool artwork while Palpatine is choking Vader. It's a double page spread and it's got Palpatine holding him in the air saying how does it feel to be so hopeless and then it shows a few images of other people that Vader has choked be it Imperial officers or Padme things like that and it just works really well. Palpatine tells Vader that he is simply a tool and Vader retaliates and says that Palpatine lied about Padme and I just want to read out what Palpatine says here because I think it's it's quite interesting. I quite enjoy it. So Palpatine says how does it feel Lord Vader to be so weak? to feel such pain, to know such fear. But how can this be? You were the chosen one, were you not? Destined to bring balance to the force. But who chooses the chosen one? And why could they not choose another? You are but a tool, Lord Vader, which can be discarded when it no longer functions. And that's when Vader says, you, you lied, told me Padme had died. And in response, Palpatine says, ha, you prove my point. It was your fear of losing Padme that brought you to my side. I turned your weakness into unimaginable strength. But now that weakness returns and threatens everything you've gained. So let me teach you fear again to bring back your power. Forget Padme. Forget the boy. Forget everything. And as he says this, you're watching Vader's like suit sparking and his three mechanical limbs, so both his legs and his arm, have just been completely crushed. So he's just left with his leg stumps and his arm and his head. And the final thing Palpatine says here, but your emperor. So obviously forget the boy, forget Padme, forget everything, but your emperor. And with that, all of the mechanical limbs of Vader's just collapse to the floor, apart from the one that he had when he was Anakin from Attack of the Clones, and he falls in a heap on the floor. And Palpatine says, You must find yourself again, old friend. You must relearn the primacy of power above all else, or you must die. So with that, Palpatine then dumps Vader onto Mustafar. Now, Mustafar obviously was the place that Anakin and Obi-Wan fought each other in Revenge of the Sith, and that is also where Anakin killed all of the Separatist leaders as well, just before that all happened. And Mustafar, I've said this quite a few times before, but just in brief, it actually used to be a very luscious planet with green life and all kinds of forests and that sort of thing. But in the virtual reality game called Vader Immortal, it is explained that there used to be this artifact called the Bright Star that gave Mustafar its lush, well, its green power, that sort of thing. And that some woman basically took it and tried to use it to restore her husband from death. And she failed, which kind of cursed the planet and set the whole thing into disarray. And then it became like a lava planet and all that sort of stuff. And then in Vader Immortal, one of the descendants of this woman goes into Vader's castle, goes around it. It's the whole game in essence. And then manages to find the bright star, put it back into place. And then I think Vader tries to use it to bring back Padme. And then the main character ends up destroying the bright star artifact fact which then restores balance to the planet of Mustafar. Now this seems to happen around the time of the original trilogy and then by the time of the rise of Skywalker uh, so 30 odd years later Kylo Ren is then there right at the start it's like the first thing you see in Rise of Skywalker is Kylo Ren killing loads of people on this weird desolate planet that's also got lots of trees and things. That is actually Mustafar uh, because 30 years after the Bright Star was destroyed then the planet starts to heal itself. And there is actually going to be another connection to the Rise of Skywalker, a deleted scene in fact, but I will be getting to that in a bit. So anyway, on Mustafar, Palpatine dumps Vader basically back where he found him and confirms that last time Palpatine had to rebuild him. Now, Vader must rebuild himself and he cannot use the Force. Palpatine says that if he uses the Force, then he will know and it will all come to an end. So Palpatine leaves and Vader then crawls to his lightsaber and grabs it. He sees Obi-Wan walking away from him, you know, as a vision in essence. 
And then has a sort of memory of a new hope when he fights Obi-Wan on the Death Star. And then Obi-Wan says, you know, if you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can ever imagine. And then Vader slices him. But in this vision, when Vader slices him, it is actually Palpatine who he slices right at the very end there. I'm not sure if that means if he kills Palpatine, Palpatine would become more powerful than he ever imagined, or if Vader's just thinking how much he would want to kill Palpatine. But regardless, it shows that Maz Armeda is speaking with Palpatine and confirms that Vader is still alive and he is heading for the ruins of the Techno Union. Uh, the ruins of the Techno Union, that's the place that Anakin killed all of the leaders of the Separatists, which I will go through shortly. But the Techno Union, they were in the prequel trilogy and the leader of them was Wat Tambor. He was a Skakoan. Uh, they had to wear special suits so they could breathe because their bodies couldn't handle the pressure and the atmosphere of the majority of planets in Star Wars. They had like a really specific thing, so they had to wear these pressurized suits all the time. Uh, you do get to hear him speak a little bit in Attack of the Clones. He's the one who kind of speaks and then twists his dials and he goes, Reader the Techno Union will be, you know, an ally or something. That's who I'm referring to. They are also in the Clone Wars in one or two arcs as well, from what I can remember. But yeah, Anakin kills them all. Or rather, Darth Vader kills them all on uh, Mustafar. And also, when Vader is crawling towards this Techno Union ruins, Maz Armeda says to Palpatine that Vader wants to kill him. And Palpatine just laughs and says, yep, I'm aware, almost everyone wants to kill me. But Palpatine says that he actually is sending someone called Ochi of Bastoon. So Ochi of Bestoon, he is in flashbacks in The Rise of Skywalker. He is the one who basically has that Sith blade that Rey and Lando and etc. all eventually find. And that Sith blade is not the most convoluted thing in the whole of Star Wars, in my opinion. I think it's absolute nonsense. But besides that, Ochi of Bestoon is a Sith assassin. He features quite heavily in these Vader comics, or at least in this arc and then the War of the Bounty Hunters. So if any of you have listened to my War of the Bounty Hunters episodes, you will already vaguely know who he is. But yeah, he's basically just a Sith assassin and he talks quite a lot because in all these Vader comics, he always has to have someone near him that talks quite a lot because otherwise it's just Vader brooding and wandering about. But yeah, that is where issue number six ends. Uh, so with that in mind, let's move on to issue number seven. So this issue starts with a flashback. It shows that Anakin is speaking with Palpatine and Palpatine asks if he has killed all of the younglings in the temple. Anakin says that he did and Palpatine says that you have done well, my apprentice. Now, Lord Vader, go and bring peace to the Empire. It shows Vader crawling closer and closer to the ruins of the Techno Union. While he's doing this, he is slowly being pursued by Ochi of Bestoon, and he's having a few flashbacks as well. One of the flashbacks shows that Anakin enters the room where all those Separatists are, and then he just starts slicing through all of them. The Nemordian called Newt Gunray is saying, well, the war is over. Lord City has promised us peace. We only want to. And then obviously Anakin slices through him. You see that in Revenge of the Sith. And then it shows the flashback of Anakin slicing through him. And then it shows Newt Gunray's remains on the floor, just rotting, which is pretty pleasant. Now, Newt Gunray, he is, as I said, a Nemoidian. That is the species. He is the main antagonist in The Phantom Menace. He's the one who orders the blockade of Naboo. Uh, he's kind of been manipulated by Sidious at the time, but he is the primary person who's doing all that sort of stuff. And then he continuously is trying to get Padme Amidala killed. He is one of the ones that wants the assassination attempts. So when you see it in the start of Attack of the Clones, when the ship blows up and Jango Fett puts those poisonous millipede things in her room and all that sort of stuff. Well, actually, it's when Zam Wessel does that. But still, when all the bounty hunters and explosions, etc., are trying to kill Padme, that's because of Newt Gumray. She, he specifically wants Padme to be killed. In addition, he's a Nemoidian. He is noseless. The Nemoidians are actually related to the Duros species. Uh, there are numerous other Duros in Star Wars, uh, even in like the original trilogy and stuff, but a famous one is called Shriv, who is in the Battlefront 2 campaign mode. He's also in a few other bits and pieces too, and there's a Duros in the other comics I've been tackling, the main run of Star Wars comics. So, you know, there's lots of them. But What's interesting about Nemoidians is they are actually born as grubs, so basically giant maggot larvas. And they actually, until they're about seven-ish is when they reach maturity, but they live in hives, which is quite interesting. Obviously, you're thinking about gigantic maggot things that form into humanoids. That's quite a bizarre thing. But with that in mind, let's move on. So after Vader sees Newt Gumray's corpse and stuff, he then grabs a mouse droid. He reprograms the mouse droid and then the mouse droid goes off and then comes back with like a droid leg and then helps Vader attach the droid leg to one of his stumps. And then he just continuously does that until Vader has a mismatch of droid limbs. Ochi of Bestoon then appears and is talking quite a lot and Vader manages to get the drop on him. Literally, he falls from like the ceiling and lands on Ochi. 
Ochi manages to get a couple of jabs in with this electro staff he's got and then pulls a blaster. And as he does, Vader has then gone. Vader is like talking to him from a distance and Ochi is speaking back to him saying, you know, you're a coward and etc. And Vader says to Ochi that Palpatine will consume you and throw you away. Ochi then mocks him and mentions the fact that Vader let all those handmaidens go, so it's kind of his own doing. As Ochi's walking, he then falls through this concrete area. Seemingly, it's by Vader, because after he starts to fall, Vader then grabs Ochi by the throat. Vader then asks Ochi what Palpatine wants, and Ochi says he wants Vader to be dead, and confirms that Palpatine has more power than Vader could imagine. Power only the Emperor can build. And then Vader says, where? Where is the building? And Ochi's like, what are you talking about? I'm not saying anything was being built or anything. And Vader's like, no, I know something is up. And before Vader gets his answer, Ochi manages to escape his grip and then jumps over Vader by jumping off his head and then lands on the other side of this sort of lava pool. Ochi's then about to go through this cave entrance and Vader can hear this voice calling to him every now and then. And as Ochi gets near the cave entrance, Vader then throws his lightsaber at him. Ochi manages to catch the lightsaber and then goes into this cave. Once inside the cave, he then shoots the entrance and things, which makes rock falls to block the entrance. And then obviously Vader can't get in. With all this ruckus, it seems to awaken some sort of being that you can see in the background. And Vader can hear this being's voice more and more, saying things like, you don't even know the questions to ask or how to understand the answers. And ha, look at you. Your fury cannot solve the riddles of the eye of the webbish bog. And that is where the comic ends. And the comic ends with a panel of seeing this being, which is the eye of the webbish bog. It is this strange creature that seems to... If you imagine a spider that is absolutely gigantic, but it has the head almost like of a frog, kind of, but also the ends of the spider legs have, like, webbed feet. So it's kind of like the feet of a duck on the legs of a spider connected to a giant frog torso, and it's sat on this big head thing that's half submerged in the lava, and the head thing then changes in the next comic. It's quite bizarre and quite weird. It's a very strange being. But the reason I actually bring it up is the Eye of the Webbish Bog is actually in a deleted scene from The Rise of Skywalker. When Kylo Ren goes to Mustafar and gets the Wayfinder, between him killing all those things and then sliding open that stone box and then pulling the Wayfinder out, he actually interacts with the Eye of the Webbish Bog, which is this being that you get more information on, I think, in the next issue. Kylo then, after defeating X amount of people, the Eye of the Webbish Bog says that Vader told him to protect the Wayfinder, and then Kylo Ren gets the Wayfinder, he passes the test, and then, you know, goes on with the rest of the movie. But the deleted scene, which was, I'm not sure if it was canon at the time, but since then, the novelization of The Rise of Skywalker has been released. I believe it's by Ray Carson. And these extended editions, there's one of Force Awakens, one of Last Jedi. In fact, there's one of all the recent canon movies. And they're basically the novelizations add extra scenes that are canon and extra moments. Like the Rise of Skywalker one explains that Palpatine's son, who is Rey's dad, is actually a clone of him. And it kind of gives a bit more weight and a bit more explanation to that. I mean, it's not overly clear still, but we get a little bit more information from that. So that's what the Rise of Skywalker novelization does. And in that is this webbish bog interaction. But yeah, that is the end of issue number seven, which is the second of the six of these that make up this storyline. So we move on to issue number eight. So much like plenty of other comics from this 2020 Darth Vader run, there are quite a few visions in this issue. Uh, so I just want to flag that before proceeding. So once again, benefits from you guys reading the comics on Marvel Unlimited or physically or whatever. Um, but yeah, issue eight starts with Ochi saying he thinks he's basically bested Vader. He's currently holding his saber. And Sly Moore is there and disagrees with Ochi. Now, Sly Moore is known as the Embaran. Uh, you can see her in the prequels. She's a bold, skinny, white individual who is human. Well, she's Embaran, but she looks human. And she wears a lot of grey and really, really light blue. She has some degree of force sensitivity. I gave her a bit more information in one of the War of the Bounty Hunters episodes I've done, which take place after this volume finishes. So if you want even more information on her, go check those out. But anyway, Ochi says that no one has returned from from the Eye of the Webbish Bog. In the meantime, Vader is being attacked by some lava nymphs. Now, a lava nymph is this flying bug thing that seems to breathe fire. It's about the size of like an American football or like a rugby ball. And 
You can actually see them in the VR game Vader Immortal. It's in the second episode of that. And then there's also some other similar things that Vader has to slice through, including some lava fleas and some other local fauna to Mustafar. You can actually see some lava fleas in episode three, I think, in the background and stuff. And they are also mentioned in the Dark Disciple book. And they are also in the IDW Star Wars Adventures Tales from Vader's Castle, which I tackled the first volume of that as a Halloween special back in episode 76 of styles comics and canon i'm pretty sure there were lava fleas in that one but i think it was just like for one or two panels i'm not sure i even mentioned them but um yeah i'd recommend that also dark disciple i've actually done a book review of that on my patreon but i'll go into more information on that right at the very end of this but anyway, so Vader is now nearing the Eye of the Webbish Bog, and the Bog is just constantly asking Vader questions. You know, are you the Chosen One? Would you be the Chosen One if you got to choose? Who chooses the Chosen One? Like, lots of cryptic questions, and they are in almost every panel of this, so I'm not going to read them all out. But one of the main things he asks is, who is he, and has he been chosen? And then while that's all happening, there's a lot of visions that Vader is having. He has visions of Obi-Wan, as well as Palpatine and things. And then a Rogwart attacks. So a Rogwart, you actually see them in the second volume of the 2015 run of Star Wars comics. They're between issues 10 and 12, and I think the volume is called Showdown on Smuggler's Moon. I tackled it in episode 13 of Star Wars Comics in Canon, and General Grievous actually had a Rogwart as well in one of the Clone Wars episodes called, I think it's Lair of Grievous, which is the 10th episode of the first season. But yeah, the Rogwart, if you're a long-term listener, the one you'll remember me laughing about was Congo the Disemboweler. That's the thing that Luke fights against in that Star Wars comic from 2015, in episode 13 of Star Wars Comics in Canon. And just his name, Congo the Disemboweler, is just so hilarious to me and so over the top. Uh, but that was Rogwart. It's just like, imagine an even bigger Rancor mixed with what we think the devil would look like. That's kind of what one of these things are. They've got giant horns, terrifying face, and just hulking body. So, wouldn't want to fight one of them. But... Darth Vader fights one of these and then kills it pretty swiftly. He then heads through this creepy looking door and then confronts the Eye of the Webbish Bog. He thinks that the Eye of the Webbish Bog is actually working for Palpatine. The Eye of the Webbish Bog seems to just kind of ignore this and then ask him another cryptic question and then Vader gets closer and closer to where the Bog is, then falls through some flooring and then holds onto something, still asking the Bog questions and then eventually gets to where the Bog is. So the Bog I mentioned prior is sat on this head of a giant sort of thing. It kind of maybe looks like an orc or something like that. This weird spider-ish thing that I described earlier. It's sat on that head thing and the head thing is in lava. So almost like the body of whatever it's sat on is submerged in lava. Vader walks up to the bog and says, lies, tricks, enough, give me what I came for. And then the bog says, you mean what you want, what you need, or does it even matter? And when he asks that of Vader, each panel shows that the head that the bog is on changes. So when he asks what you want, he's actually sat on what looks like the head of Anakin in the Clone Wars, so long hair with a scar. Then when he asks what you need, he's sat on Luke Skywalker's head. And then when he says, does it even matter, he is sat on Palpatine's head. He then asks Vader, if you've been chosen, who cares what you choose? And then Vader says, I have chosen, and you will care. And then this bog creature's, whatever it's sat on, the weird orc body thing giant, it then comes out of the lava that it was submerged in, and it's now just looking like it was originally, and extends a hand. And the hand has got the wayfinder on it. And the webbish bog says, do you think you've passed your test or failed it? Vader then finds an old Jedi starfighter, and it is actually specifically an Eta 2 Actis class light interceptor, so ETA-2 and then all the other stuff I said. They're basically the starfighters that Anakin and Obi-Wan are flying at the start of Revenge of the Sith. So Anakin's flying a yellow one and Obi-Wan's flying a red one. And they're just kind of like the next step after the Aether Sprite. I think it's the Delta-7 Aether Sprites, which is the triangular Jedi starfighters you saw in Episode 2. But um, yeah, Vader finds an old one of those. Then Ochi approaches on a starship and says, Congratulations, Vader. No one's ever returned from the Eye, much less nabbed a Wayfinder. But you can't escape me so easily. And Vader responds to saying, Good, I need more parts. And he looks up and sees Ochi with a few droids and things with weapons. And that is where comic number eight ends. So I try to make that one as coherent as possible, but it's a lot of visions. There's a lot of questions that the Eye of the Webbish Bog is asking, which don't get answered or don't really make sense or whatever. Uh, mixed it all together. It's kind of hard to explain in an audio medium. I hope it did an all right job, but 
you know, the broad strokes are just that Vader went through some sort of Force Vision-ish test thing and got a Wayfinder. So that's that's really, could have just skipped the whole comic and said that in one sentence, couldn't I? Um, but yeah, anyway, so we move on to issue number nine. So it starts with Ochi attacking Vader with the droid crush of Bestoon. They're all shooting blasters at Vader, who doesn't have his lightsaber, so he can't, you know, deflect them back in his usual way. And instead, he throws things at them, he pulls them towards him, he slices them with his, like, robotic arm, you know, because his arm is now replaced by, like, an old droid. So I don't know if it'd be stronger or weaker than the arm he had before, but he's just cutting through droids left, right, and center. Then one of the droids mentions that someone saw value in him. He briefly thinks of Palpatine, and then the droid says that Vader's flesh has failed. The droid then slices Vader's leg and takes a part of it, and then notices that it's cheap parts that are over 30 years old, and he notices that the rest of the suit is actually standard, it's just junk. So the droid goes back to Ochi and is yelling at him and saying, we've already lost four droids on this, and you told me that this was a value, and Vader's suit is just made out of complete junk, which is useless to us. While this droid is berating Ochi, Ochi is leaning up against a door, and then Vader's hand comes through the door, grabs Ochi, and pulls him through. When Ochi is through the door, Vader then takes his lightsaber back, and then you get this really cool montage of a couple pages of Vader just slicing through these droids, deflecting blaster bolts and things, basically just destroying them, because he will then use some of their parts to slightly upgrade his arms and legs that have been damaged. So once the battle has ended, Vader is then sat by the starfighter and he is fixing it up. He asks Ochi how the Wayfinder works, and Ochi says there are nav coordinates within the glyphs. He plugs it into Vader's Starfighter and says to go to Exegol. Vader then locks Ochi into an escape pod, and then Vader gets into the fighter, and then Vader's fighter flies above the escape pod and seemingly uses magna clamps or something to lift the escape pod up so that the Starfighter is now carrying the escape pod. So they fly off of Mustafar and go to orbit, and there is an old hyperspace ring out there. Now, hyperspace ring is a way that certain Jedi starfighters can use hyperspace because they want to make the ships, you know, small and light, and having a hyperspace engine within it, or hyperdrive engine in it, you know, increases the cost, increases the weight, increases a lot of different things, and I would assume it probably makes the ship a bit less sustainable because you need to put coaxium in there, which is the hyperspace fuel, and if you've got like a hyperdrive reactor into your vehicle, it probably means it's more explosive. I don't know the ins and outs, but I do know that, yeah, when you have small starfighters, like TIE fighters can't, st standard TIE fighters, like I know that standard TIE fighters don't have hyperdrives built into them either, so just small starships don't. And so you actually get to see one of these hyperdrive rings in Attack of the Clones, Obi-Wan, once again, uh, when he's flying his Jedi starfighter and he's pursuing Jango Fett and things. I think it's outside Kamino he connects to one and then goes off to Geonosis and whatnot. But anyway, Vader gets into this hyperspace ring with the escape pod attached to the bottom of the ship. Ochi is freaking out because he's like, you know, escape pods aren't meant for this sort of thing. Vader obviously completely ignores him and then goes into hyperspace. Ochi says that he feels sick and asks Vader not to do it again. And Vader says that nothing I do is for your benefit, which is a nice little Vader line there. They then stop being in hyperspace because there is a red cloud in front of them that has prevented them going any further. Once Ochi sees what is in the red mist, Ochi's just freaking out, telling Vader to get out of the way, jump, just let us leave this area. And Vader's like, no, I will find the Emperor's secrets, no matter what stands in our way. And what stands in their way is an absolutely gigantic, colossal space squid thing that is called a Summer Verminoth. So before I move on to issue number 10, let's give a bit of information about a Summer Verminoff. Now, any of you guys who have listened to War of the Bounty Hunters episodes will already know because I'm pretty certain I talk about it in one of those episodes. But in essence, a Summer Verminoff is a gigantic being in space and you actually get to see one in the movies. This one in this Darth Vader comic is a subspecies, which I'll get into in a second, but the one that you get to see in the movies is actually in Solo, a Star Wars story. When Solo, Lando, and Co. are flying the Millennium Falcon away from Kessel and doing the Kessel run, and he takes that shortcut, they go past something called the Maw, M-A-W. Now, the Maw is this absolutely gigantic black hole that sucks loads of things in, and when Han gets there, there is this giant jellyfish-like creature, which people often mistake for being the Maw, when it's not, that giant space creature thing is a summer verminoth. Now, they are one of the galaxy's most deadly predators, obviously due to their size, being able to live in space and etc. They just destroy things. Obviously, Han Solo manages to outmaneuver the summer verminoth at Kessel, and then it gets eaten by the Moor, or rather gets destroyed by the black hole that is the Moor. But this one in the Darth Vader comics, it doesn't really look like that. As I said, it looks like a giant space octopus squid thing. It's got one giant eye, it's deep purple, and it has a lot of teeth. Now, what makes this subspecies different, it's confirmed in the next issue, but I'm just going to tell you now. 
is that this type of summer verminoth subspecies actually hunts its own kind. So this one is like the only creature in the galaxy that hunts summer verminoths and it uses it by its incredible physical strength and things, but also it has a very strong grip on people's mental state and whatnot. And it can make people have hallucinations and all kinds of other crazy stuff. So that's basically what this thing is. And we get into more information of that into the next issue. So let's move on to issue number 10, the penultimate issue of this arc. So Vader's in his ship with Ochi in the escape pod attached below, facing this summer vermin off. Then Slymore the Umbarum pursues them with three Star Destroyers. It's confirmed that Palpatine sent Sly after Vader when Ochi failed to complete his mission. The Imperials deploy a bunch of TIE fighters. Vader, even while attached to a escape pod, manages to outmaneuver all of these TIE fighters and destroys 11 of them really, really quickly. So they then send out even more. Vader then flies near the summer Verminoff that then like shoots out his tentacles and things and destroys even more TIE fighters and whatnot. And that's when Sly mentions it's the galaxy's greatest predator and then gives a bit more information about its subspecies and etc that I've already given to you guys. And when she mentions that its attacks transcend the physical, there are a few panels about the red mist that are all around the Verminoth. So I do wonder if that mist is either from the nebula that's behind the summer Verminoth or if the summer Verminoth somehow makes that mist. It's not exactly clear, but regardless. So Vader flies towards this summer Verminoth into this red mist and things and then has some visions. He sees himself slice Obi-Wan and then he sees some of his interactions with Luke in Empire Strikes Back. Then he sees some interactions with himself with Obi-Wan in Revenge of the Sith. And then there's like some parallels and things between them. There's a lot of imagery and visions and whatnot. And then it shows a scene where Luke and Vader swap places in Empire Strikes Back where Luke is standing up and Vader is on the floor missing a hand. And then it shows that Luke actually kills Vader and then he is taken by Power Palpatine, obviously showing Vader some sort of like alternate way, but Vader is then on the floor with Luke or Anakin's lightsaber stabbed through his chest and he's just laying on the floor. The ship falls out of the red mist onto a nearby planet and Ochi asks if it showed Vader how Vader was going to die because seemingly that's what Ochi saw. The Verminoth then appears on the planet that Vader and Ochi are now on and Vader confronts it. Ochi says that he'll die and Vader says that he does not fear death, it is simply not an option. Vader then uses the Force and Ochi says that Palpatine's going to kill him and Vader then thinks fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate and hate leads to power and Vader then slams the Verminoth down on the ground. It pans out a little bit and shows that they are on the planet of Exegol. Vader rides the Verminoth towards the entrance that you see in the Rise of Skywalker and that is where this issue ends. So before moving on to the final issue of this arc, I just want to give a little bit more information on Exegol. So in The Rise of Skywalker, obviously the ninth episode in the Skywalker Saga, at present of recording this, it is the final part of the Skywalker Saga, but I think we all know in 10, 20, or maybe even 30 years, Disney, I am sure, will then do an episode 10 of Star Wars and it will kind of go from there because I don't think they can resist that. Hopefully you'll get a little bit of respite before that happens, but there we go. Anyway, The Rise of Skywalker. So obviously right at the start, you get Kylo Ren on Mustafa, he gets the wayfinder, travels to Exegol and then confronts Palpatine. So that's where Palpatine is for the entirety of The Rise of Skywalker. It's where the final battle happens in the movie as well. And um, there's just a couple of cool little facts I found in my little um, Rise of Skywalker visual dictionary book that I got. It shows that Exegol is in the Unknown Regions. It is approximately 13.6 kilometers in diameter. Uh, Planet Earth is about 12.7 kilometers. So it's actually bigger than Earth, which is quite weird to think about. And when you see those lightning strikes in the film, obviously they look really cool and it's, you know, pathetic fallacy, which is when the weather kind of mimics the mood and whatnot. And obviously it does some really good shots when you first see Palpatine and stuff. But in canon, the reason for those electrical storms and stuff is because there is so much dryness and dust on the planet of Exegol. The dust particles rub together, creating a static charge and they build up and up and up and eventually it needs to discharge, which is what those electrical seemingly lightning strikes are. There are also some huge fissures that run deep in Exegol, including one that Palpatine hides in, and they were excavated by Sith loyalists centuries ago because they were basically looking for some sort of transvergence or something within the inside of the planet. Now, Exegol is known as one of the Sith homeworlds. It is one of the places that the Sith used to travel when they wanted a safe haven thousands of years ago when the Great Sith Wars were happening. Well, when the wars between the Jedi and the Sith were happening, and then, you know, the Jedi would rule the galaxy, and then the Sith would rule the galaxy, and it'd go back and forth for thousands of years, I'm pretty certain. If I'm pretty certain that in canon it's called like the Thousand Year Darkness or something, and I think that's the time period that the Jedi and Sith were just at war with each other constantly. Uh, and that ended about a thousand years before the Phantom Menace, so about a hundred years before Yoda was born. 
And just the last bit here is, as well as Exegol, some of the first Sith planets involved were Malachor, which you see in the Clone Wars and Rebels, Zyost, Jagueda, and Relg. Now, there's one other one that I haven't mentioned, and that is called Moraband, also known as Korriban. And that Moraband is in the Clone Wars Series 6, I think it is. I believe Yoda goes there, or at least speaks about it quite a lot. And it's, I think that's when he sees the Darth Bane sort of phantom, which mentions about the Rule of Two and stuff. So, all in Legends, there's so much history of the Sith and the Jedi and Moraband, which in Legends is called Korriban, and all kinds of other stuff. But in canon, there's not actually that much. Obviously, there's going to be some sort of massive movement, probably when the High Republic is done, be it via books or series or movies or whatever. Star Wars, Disney, Lucasfilm, they are all going to delve into the Old Republic at some point because they're like some of the most popular games and some of the most popular eras of Star Wars Legends. But at present, those names of planets I just mentioned are some of the only Sith planets we really know of. And Moraband slash Korriban, both of those names work. That planet, that system, is known, I think, at present in canon as the original homeworld of the Sith. I believe the way it is in Legends is that a group of Jedi disagreed with the Jedi Order and basically went off by themselves into the galaxy to look into the dark side of the Force and sort of other stuff. And when they did that, they then organized themselves into what then became the Sith after they met this species of people who are also called the Sith, who taught them even more stuff about the dark side. It's very convoluted and trying to explain it in like three sentences is near enough impossible. But that's basically where the Sith were born. Uh, but we haven't got the explicit confirmation of that in canon, but that is generally what is accepted. So with all that Sith rambling aside, let's move on to the final issue. Issue number 11. So, issue 11 starts with Ochi telling Palpatine that Vader has arrived. Vader is still riding the Summer Verminoth and proceeds to Palpatine. A couple of giant crab things attack that are like half the size of the Summer Verminoth. Man, I've said that word so many, or the hyphenated word so many times that it's making my brain melt. And anyway, these two giant crab things attack that are like half the size of the Summer Verminoth. Uh, the Summer Verminoth then kills them fairly quickly by wrapping his tentacles around them and snapping them in half. And then Vader says that he is no longer Palpatine's apprentice. Palpatine then gives a little smug look and then uses the force to make the Summer Verminoth wrap itself up with its own tentacles and then squeeze and crush itself to death. The body of the Verminoth then falls to the ground with Vader on it. Vader steps off covered in goo or blood or whatever and Palpatine just laughs at Vader and walks into the main Exegol entrance which is what you saw Kylo Ren and then Ben Solo enter in The Rise of Skywalker. So Vader is pursuing Palpatine through the fissure in Exegol while hearing Palpatine's voice. Palpatine is like mocking Vader as standard, and Vader is walking past vats of clones, you know, basically what Snoke was of Palpatine, and also he actually sees a severed hand in a jar, and from what I can see online, and a lot of people believe that this is meant to be Luke's hand that he lost in Empire Strikes Back. So in theory, Palpatine was trying to use Luke's DNA to try and help with the cloning process to try and make a clone of himself. Uh, that is kind of speculation. You know, it's, there's not really a reason why there would be a panel specifically just showing Vader looking at a severed hand in a jar. I mean, maybe it was Anakin's, but I find that incredibly unlikely considering he had his arm cut off in Attack of the Clones and then he had his hand cut off or hand, arm, and then also legs cut off on Mustafar and they would have burnt into flames as well, but this hand wasn't burnt. So I think it is Luke's hand. I think that is the insinuation there. But yeah, anyway, that was just a nice little find. Uh, and then Vader walks past that and then some of these vats then open and there's these sort of warriors in there they're wearing like a, a one piece as well as like this mask on and their bodies like their skin's all grey and it's kind of like warty or bubbled up or something they don't look great but you can't see their faces they're wearing masks not dissimilar to what Inquisitors wear and they have electro staffs they attack Vader and after a few panels of them fighting Vader does eventually kill them all while he's sort of fighting, Ochi mentions that he thought they were only two Sith. Vader says that the warriors aren't Sith, and then Palpatine chimes in and says that they could be if Vader fails. After Vader has done away with all of those warriors, he then moves on and then gets attacked by some Sith acolytes. So Sith acolytes seemingly are just people that are generally either not force sensitive or are lower on the lower end of being force sensitive. In general, I've seen canon it's still a bit hazy, but they're people who worship the Sith. In general, they're not powerful enough to become Sith Lords or Sith Assassins or anything like that. They just kind of wander around and follow them. And a massive group of them just like kind of charge Vader with these blades they've got. Vader deignites his lightsaber and then uses the force to disarm all of these acolytes with their blades and then stabs all of them with the blades he's just taken off them. He then walks through this just now field of corpses 
And as he approaches Palpatine, or closer and closer to where Palpatine's voice is coming from, Ochi tells Vader to give up. Vader then goes down to where the Star Destroyers are, which is what you see in the Rise of Skywalker. They're the Star Destroyers that have each got like a Death Star cannon on them. Vader is just not impressed by these hundreds of Star Destroyers. He mentions that there are just more monsters and machines. He then continues onward even further, and can hear something in pain. So they get to this room where there's quite a few people, assumingly Sith Acolytes or the Sith Eternal followers or, you know, some sort of Palpatine followers, who are working on this giant crystal that's in the middle of this room. Palpatine confirms that he harvested a mountain made out of Kyber so that he could find the power to power the weapons on these Star Destroyers that can destroy planets. But Kyber must suffer for the Sith, because Kyber crystals are in the eyes of the Force, they are alive, they're kind of living. Maybe they're not conscious, but they're connected to the Force and they're alive in some way. I kind of view Kyber crystals almost like a plant, where they're just existing on a completely different plane of existence from us humans and other beings. So although we can't necessarily directly interact with them in a way of communication, we can still observe them and see that they do have some semblance of either not necessarily self-awareness, but some sort of control over themselves. Kyber crystals I kind of view as something similar to that. So kyber crystals, you know, they call out to the Jedi when Jedi go to find their kyber crystals for their lightsaber. And then as tackled in the 2017 Vader comics and the Rise of Kylo Ren comics, the Sith need to bleed a lightsaber crystal. So they hold it, put all their dark energy into it and cause this kyber crystal loads of pain. And then in doing that, the kyber crystal then bleeds, which then shows it to be the red color. And then that's when it will obey the Sith. And Palpatine continues on saying that pain will let the kyber crystals find their true power. And as he says the word power, the kyber crystal mountain thing in the middle of the room lets out this massive shockwave. It knocks loads of people down, this huge like, red mist stuff comes out of it, and Ochi's helmet gets knocked off, and then his eyes get completely burnt, like erased from his face. It's pretty intense. Palpatine then says that he has unlimited power and Vader is like approaching him still and it's in this big red mist. It looks very similar to the red mist Vader encountered when he was having that vision with the summer Verminoth back in the previous issue. And Vader is in more and more pain as he gets close to Palpatine and Palpatine obviously saying he has unlimited power and saying that he could incinerate Vader in an instant. He says to Vader, you can feel the burn, you can feel how I can incinerate your flesh and how close I am to just completely destroying you. And you know that that's not hard for me to do at all. You don't understand how much power I have here. And Vader needs to choose. Palpatine says that if he goes to Palpatine, he'll never escape the terrible pain he's in. But Palpatine can share the power that he has. Then there's a few flashbacks to Empire Strikes Back and it shows that him and Luke have swapped. So then it's got Luke standing up over Vader with his hand cut off saying, join me, we can defeat the Emperor, etc, etc. And then the final panels of this comic and the end of this arc shows Vader kneeling along with Maz Ahmeda, Slymore and Ochi calling Palpatine Master. And that's where the comic ends. So to clarify here, I think that when he was kneeling with Maz Ahmeda and stuff, I don't think Maz Ahmeda was actually there on Exegol. He could have been because Slymore and Ochi were there, but I think that was more of like an image thing. But Vader is basically just kneeling to Palpatine's power because he just can't fathom trying to defeat him. And I think this plays quite well into Vader's turn in Return of the Jedi because the whole time Vader is just saying to Luke, look, you're not strong enough. We can't beat him. He's too powerful. And obviously from Empire Strikes Back to where we are now in these comics, obviously Vader did have some rebellion in him. And we've seen from previous comics, there are a lot of times that Vader does go against Palpatine. Vader does hate Palpatine for enslaving him, basically, and tricking him and making him into basically what he is now. Obviously, Anakin is hugely to blame for all that, but Palpatine is almost equally to blame. And Vader's little acts of rebellions against Palpatine, they always get crushed, normally by Palpatine himself. And I just like the fact that, especially, you know, within a year of Vader turning back to the light, you actually get to see him still trying to fight off Palpatine, and then him just being crushed by the power of Palpatine, and just how incomprehensibly strong he is. But my friends, that is the end of that Vader run, so that links straight into the War of the Bounty Hunters prelude that I tackled on episode 60 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, and then it will continue the War of the Bounty Hunters in episode 64, 68, and then I think 73, from what I can recall. But then next week, I'm going to be tackling the finale of the War of the Bounty Hunters. That is going to be the fifth chapter. That is going to be the War of the Bounty Hunters, 
issue number five, as well as the IG-88 issue, as well as the relevant issues from Aphra, Star Wars, Darth Vader, and also Bounty Hunters. So we'll see what happens after that in the new year, because I've already got order of more comics coming my way. I know that Crimson Rain is going to be a thing. I don't know if that's going to be its own miniseries, or if once again that's going to tie in with all of the main comics again. I'm not sure. We'll kind of have to see as I read it, because if it does tie in with everything, then once a month I will just do the same thing I've been doing with War of the Bounty Hunters. But I'll confirm that either in the new year or next week, depending on how much information I know at the time, and depending what comics I've received from uh, Forbidden Planet, which is where I order them. And then the week after that is actually going to be Christmas. So I do have a little plan of something I think I might do for Christmas. Um, There's an issue of a comic called Life Day, number one, and it's about Han celebrating Life Day with Chewie. Obviously, Life Day is the infamous element of the Star Wars holiday special where the Wookiees celebrate something that seems to take place on the same day as Thanksgiving, but is kind of more like Christmas. And in the Star Wars holiday special, the Lego one from last year, that is really good. I do recommend you guys watch that if you haven't. It's on Disney+. Plus. It is really fun. Uh, That is you know although it's kind of it's like set between thanksgiving and christmas i think the date of life day is actually thanksgiving beer it's very much closer to christmas i don't know but i'm gonna read that life day comic because i've had an email that i should be getting that in the next week or so and i'm gonna see what that's all like and then i'll probably just do like a one-off special episode for christmas and that'll be just a nice fun thing for you guys to have i'm hoping um, me saying this that the comic isn't going to arrive and be like 48 pages long and be completely riddled with complicated story and huge amount of connections because (laughs) i think i'll regret that but we shall see and then the week after that i think is like new year's eve or new year's day I won't be releasing a normal episode then. Uh, I will probably end up putting one of the Patreon episodes I have done for one of the Stars, Batch of Stars films. I think me and Megan did uh, the prequels, the originals, and then some of the other ones we've done like individual episodes for. I can't remember if we've done Solo and Rogue One. Oh no, no, we did do Solo and Rogue One. So I'll figure it out because I recall a little while ago I released a few on this feed as well. So whichever ones I haven't yet released on this feed, I will then put on here. I'll at least put one of them, just so you guys have something. So I'll try and make a note of that. Uh, But speaking of Patreon, I want to say that I've actually recorded a book review for The Dark Disciple. So it's a book about Sarge Ventress and Quinlan Voss at the tail end of The Clone Wars. And it's made from unused scripts of The Clone Wars. And instead of doing like a full episode on it, because as much as I enjoy doing the full episodes of the book reviews for The High Republic, they take a lot of work, like even more work than these episodes take. Because in these episodes, I read through the comics, make some general notes of what the plot is, ramble a little bit, but also talk about the many connections. I can't do that with a book review. A comic is far easier uh, to do that. So what I've instead decided to do is for the High Republic stuff, I'm going to keep doing those book reviews, going to keep on churning them out until we get to the end of the High Republic, which is like another several phases away. I think we're getting into wave three of the first phase in January, and that'll be another three books, uh, as well as all the other comics and that other stuff. So it basically means every six months, we're going to get three more books. And that's going to be, we've got another eight waves yet. If there's going to be three waves in phase two and three waves in phase three, then we're going to have, yeah, seven waves from now. You know, once we get past January, February, then there'll only be another six waves to do. But I still haven't done the book review for Race to Crash Point Tower. Still haven't finished reading Out of the Shadows, which is the YA young adult book for from phase one wave two so there's a lot to read and there's even more to podcast about and things so i think just for the normal Star Wars books that i'm reading you know dark disciple i recently finished i also am currently making my way through the legends book shatter point which is all about mace windu which is quite interesting i'm towards the end of that i've been listening to quite a few audiobooks and things which are some of the star wars content that i haven't consumed be it in canon or in legends and so i'm going to also check out a bunch of the other ones. There's quite a few other audiobooks for the current canon that I am intrigued by. So I think I'm just going to listen to audiobooks of the non High Republic stuff. And then with those ones, I'm going to record like a short review. So the review I recorded of Dark Disciple was just like, I put my phone in a holder, started recording and then turned the engine on and then, you know, started driving and then didn't turn it off until I finished and got out of the car. I just want to clarify to anyone who's worried I'm recording while driving. I'm not touching the phone at all while I'm driving or anything. I'm just talking with my phone on the record setting and then I'll edit out all the massive amount of noise at the end (laughs) because I I basically spoke for, I think, 15 or 20 minutes or so and I was just more so telling my opinion of the plot and the general themes and I did a bit of spoiler-free stuff towards the start and then towards the end I just said to people that if you want to know what happens in the book in broad strokes, here is what happens. But I don't go into the same level of depth as I do with the High Republic book reviews and 
I've only released this on Patreon, or rather, it's not yet on Patreon. It's going to be released in Patreon before the end of the year. It's probably going to be next week or maybe the week after. I just need to clean up the audio a bit to make sure, you know, it doesn't sound like car the whole time so you can actually hear my voice. So I have recorded that. So I'm going to start doing, I think, book reviews that are not High Republic stuff and put them on Patreon. So if you want access to Patreon stuff, which I release at least one episode of Afterthoughts every week, some are with Megan, obviously some aren't because that one I just mentioned isn't, uh, for as little as £1 a month, if you go to patreon.com slash genuinechitschat, you get a link to an RSS feed that you can pop into your podcast player of your choice, or you can download the Patreon app or go on the Patreon website itself and you can listen to stuff there. And you basically, yeah, you get an episode of Afterthoughts every week and they're between 10 and 30 minutes minutes long each time and at the moment there are all there are over 75 uploads to the patreon exclusive feed it's only been going since like march so there are hours and hours and hours of additional content of movie reviews comic reviews tv series reviews some spoiler free some not we do clarify when they are spoiler free they're mainly for the new films we saw like shang chi and eternals and those sort of things Uh, venom let them be carnage i think have we done one of those yet? Yeah, yeah, we did Venom Let Me Let There Be Carnage as well. So if you want a good way of hearing my voice more, if you want to hear some of the banter that I have with Megan and you just want to hear her lovely voice more, and you want to get a few extra Star Wars book reviews, some comic reviews of non-Star Wars stuff, as well as, yeah, reviews of TV shows and also movies and stuff, and you want to support the show financially, please consider checking out patreon.com slash genuine chit chat. As I said, for a little as one pound a month, you'll get hours and hours of extra content every month and you'll support the show. And there's lots of other bonus content as well for the higher tiers. But um, that's my plug for Patreon. Uh, I've told you what I'm doing for the rest of Star Wars Comics in Canada for the rest of the year. Uh, and then there's also just all of the various guest spots I've been doing. There's lists of them in the show notes on Star Wars Timeline, on Beer Nuts Productions, on Hall of Mares. Loads of different places that I've been involved with recently. Just always check the show notes and stuff. And also, if you're listening this far in, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, a few more of you have subscribed since the last episode, so I appreciate that. But if everyone who's listening right now can subscribe, it will just push those numbers up because if I can just get 100 people subscribed, and I'm on about 70 at the moment, if I can just get a few more of you subscribed, I can change the channel link from slash blah, 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 blah to genuine chit chat which is what i really really want but guys i think that's going to be enough from me here so um thank you as always for listening i appreciate each and every one of you listening and if you don't want to contribute to the show financially you can always leave a review on good pods or apple podcasts or podcast addict or anywhere like that you can share the show on social media you can tell your friends about it and you can scream the name styles comics and canon from the rooftops your neighbors won't know what it is but it'll make me happy um but yeah thank you so much for listening guys as always i appreciate each and every one of you and i will talk to you guys next week with the last episode of standard styles comics and canon for the year and that will be war of the bounty hunters five so um i'll talk to you guys then and as always may the force be with you the intro for star wars comics and canon is arranged by myself mike burton and the backing music was made by eric matias of soundimage.org you have just experienced host creator everything else of genuine chit chat and also the host and creator of Star Wars Comics and Canon, found on the Comics in Motion podcast, Mike Burton.